Hello, Shabab, Shiab, Hello, Tayyibin. So we're here for the next installment of the vlog, and I'm in picturesque at Fahidi because I want to turn back the clock this week, and I want to talk about an idea that I think really permeates pop culture, global pop culture, when it comes to talking about representations of the Middle East, and that is that we're, well, people think we're kind of savage and not in the Gen Z, Logan Paul sort of way. I mean, what's wrong with this picture? I, nothing, right? I mean, you're so used to seeing someone dressed like me, sitting in a place like this, but just think about it for a second. How often do you see scenes like this in TV or movies? Camels. Harem. More camels. Dirty Bazaar. Even more camels. So even when we're in hyper-modern cities like Dubai or Abu Dhabi, you can't get away from it. I mean, just in last year's geostorm, we're right by Sheikh Zayed Road, the Burj Khalifa, and yet there's still a camel. Why? So what's the big deal, right? I mean, everyone loves a camel, camels are cute, but what's the underlying implication? It's that at our heart, underneath all the skyscrapers and the technology, we're still desert savages. The idea of the noble savage is not a new trend. I mean, it goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. There's a play in 466 BC simply called the Persians, where the Greeks are at war with the Persians, and their Persians are characterized as weak, dictatorial, and that worst of all Western crimes, undemocratic. But I'm what do you say, that was a long time ago. That would never happen today, right? Oh. I am, of course, talking about Orientalism and the way the Middle East has been portrayed in popular culture to allow the West to assert moral authority over the region. This type of storytelling is why we see such an emphasis on the sexual deviancy of harems, uh, repression of women, violent tribal conflicts, and the general characterization of people from the Middle East being sneaky or underhanded. First up, the Orient is hardly a specific classification. It basically covers the area from North Africa all the way across to the Far East. That's a pretty big area to generalize. So let's look at some more recent culprits. Who saw Aladdin in the theater? Well, I did, at the age of eight. And within the first five minutes, this is something I actually heard. Oh, I come from a land, from a faraway place, where the caravan camels roam. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. I actually enjoyed that film, although Jasmine's clothing is pretty much as close as you can get to harem wear in a kid's film. Everyone knows Aladdin's source material, right? Elf Leda Waleda or A Thousand and One Nights. Did you know in the original Arabic language version, Aladdin, Ali Baba, and Sindbad were not actually even there? The three best known stories were added later by European translators who basically reinforced the Orientalist view in the way that they wrote it, the idea of strange customs in a strange land. I can show you the world from a biased Western perspective. Want more examples? Here's a Looney Tune cartoon I watched growing up. God will this treasure, O Hassan, or the jackal shall grow fat on thy carcass. Oh, mighty genie. The sun shot! Yes, we all speak just like that. And here's the Arabian Knight from the X-Men comics of the 1980s. Don't worry, he's still around today. Also, clearly not written by anyone who speaks a word of Arabic. His name is Abdul Qamar, which means servant of the moon. Newsflash, we do not worship the moon. We in fact worship the same God as the Christian and Jewish faiths. We're on your team, guys. Even the heroic Middle Eastern characters have their defining characteristic revolve around their savagery. So let's take, for example, the 1999 film with Brendan Fraser, The Mummy. And no, I don't mean the shambling corpse that was the Tom Cruise vehicle. The film had one of my favorite Middle Eastern characters as a teenager, Ardeth Bey. He was strong, dashing, a mythical warrior, a magi. And I mean, look at those face tattoos. Do you have any idea how painful it would be to get a tattoo on your face? That's hardcore. But going back to the film a lot older and a little wiser, 
I realized that Ardeth Bey isn't that different from Looney Tunes' Hassan Chop or X-Men's Arabian Night. He interacts with the world as a noble savage, as a warrior, not an intellectual. He is not an equal to Rachel Wise's Evelyn, who actually manages to save the day through her intellect, not through her sword. And here's the kicker. I liked this character as a kid because somewhere along the way, we here in the Middle East began to believe the Western narrative ourselves. So I've been filming here in the Middle East for over 10 years, and every time someone comes to ask me to film culture, I get asked to do the greatest hits. Here I am in a traditional suit. Here I am about to go fishing. And maybe die for pearls. This is how I get to work every day. And I drink milk straight from the teat. Here I am in the desert. And the thing is, it's not actually Europeans usually asking me to film this stuff. It's my fellow Arabs. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be proud of this. Of course we should. In fact, there's credible evidence that the first place that camels were domesticated, where the first people rode camels, was right here in the UAE. That's amazing. But we treat it as if this is all of our culture instead of just a small piece of it. We have a space program. We have nuclear engineers. We live in one of the most advanced countries in the world. But when we export our culture, we rely on the same imagery that was pushed upon us, forced upon us by the West centuries ago. So next time a film or TV show is made in the Middle East, I have a humble request. Instead of camels, why don't we try a three-dimensional Middle Eastern character who is defined by their ideas and their knowledge instead of their mastery of the Bedouin arts or their warrior spirit? Now that's savage. Kids, did I do it right?